Hello, my name is Mary Ellen King, and I'm president of the Austin Bar Association. You are now attending an episode of Stop the Stigma podcast. It is an initiative of the Austin Bar Association to stop the stigma around discussing mental health, uh, suicide awareness, and substance abuse. Today, we have Paul Jacobs, who has his own personal story of recovery and also has a very active role with TLAP. Um, Paul, welcome so much, and thank you for joining us today. Hello. Thank you. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about you? Well, thank you. Well, again, my name is Paul Jacobs. I'm a, uh, an alcoholic. My sober date is uh, February 28th, 2019, and I'm very grateful. Uh, so before that, I was a trial lawyer uh, in Houston. I graduated University of Houston Law Center in 1984. Uh, five years before Texas Lawyers Assistance Program ever got started, so we weren't made aware of it. Um, I did insurance defense work for about uh, five years. Uh, uh, then I got recruited to do plaintiff personal injury. I became uh, earned board certification in civil trial law and personal injury trial law by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization and uh, civil trial advocacy by the National Board of Trial Advocates. I tried maybe over 100 cases, took over 1,000 depositions. Um, and then um, about uh, 25 years into my practice, I got injured really badly. I was diagnosed with a fractured back, a herniated disc, and some other injuries, and was prescribed opioids. Um, so just a little bit more background. So. I did some drinking and uh, experimenting with drugs in college and law school, um, but then stopped. I got uh, a job. I was a trial lawyer. I, w I got married. I was a father of two amazing kids. My son's a lawyer in Houston now. My daughter's a social worker with Texas Children's Hospital, and they were vital in my, my recovery. Um, but uh, so I, then after. Uh, the, all those years I got hurt, I tried op opioids, and I had been prescribed opioids on and off for uh, my whole life because I was a college athlete, played tennis in college, broke ankles, sprained ankles, you know, rotator cuff injuries, all that. But um, I never got addicted. I was able to take them, stop, and move on. As some of you know, it's a progressive disease. Not only my susceptibility to opioids progressed, but my what I call, I call it ESRD. I had excessive self-reliance disorder. <laughs> I, I, got, I was trained to fix other people and solve other people's problems. So I had self-diagnosed, self-treated, and um, it got very, very bad and very, very dark. And we can talk more about that. Eventually, my disease got so bad On February 27th, 2019, I'm so ill physically, emotionally, that uh, I needed um, a wheelchair just to get around. Um, I had a flight to Minnesota. A few months earlier, I saw a doctor in Houston at the uh, Baylor College of Medicine. He was supposedly the top doctor in Houston in his field. And he said that my particular medical condition was so far gone that only one doctor in the world that can, could fix it. And that doctor was a guy named Grant Hamilton III at uh, the Mayo Clinic. So this is like in December. And I'm thinking, I get to go to Scottsdale. No. Maybe <laughs> Jacksonville, Florida. No. Rochester, Minnesota. And... Um, I looked into the Mayo Clinic and I find out they have not only that doctor is the best in the world, they, I had major GI problems, I had cardiac problems, obviously my addiction problem, orthopedic injuries, of course, my back. Um, and uh, so I got on the, ho the phone and made that six appointments over 12 days, flew out there. It was 72 degrees on February 27, 2019 in Houston. I get there, it's 23 below zero. 
I was about to say, it was not that in Minnesota when you got up there in February, I'm sure. <laughs> 95 degree change. Some of them say, are you willing to go in any length? Oh, at the 95 degrees. Um, and then, and oh, now 1,200 miles. Uh, and then I, I get there, and um, uh, the next morning I see Dr. Hamilton. And, and this is what's in, in, uh, important to me. I see him. I needed a wheelchair uh, from the motel uh, uh, to get to the doctor's office. I'm, uh, and I'm, I'm de- what do you call it? deconditioned. I'm thin. I'm gaunt. I'm in a lot of pain. I'm in a lot of fear. I'm confused. Um, see, uh, I, not only had I been doing opioids, but my brain changed. Um, my brain chemistry changed. I started having symptoms consistent of major depressive disorder. So in hindsight, I don't know whether or not I really had major depressive disorder or whether I had opioid use disorder, because some of the symptoms are the same. I was having difficulty thinking, um, m- reduced motivation, reduced focus, reduced interest in things. Uh, I was having a lot of pain, you know, whether the pain was uh, secondary pain or not. Um, and so my brain and that mindset said, what's a steroid for lawyers? Cocaine. So I tried cocaine. And uh, unfortunately for me, it worked. My brain reacted to it positively. Um, in term, what I mean by that is I started thinking clearly. I was able to focus. I was able to perform. Uh, I won major cases high on coke, major med- mediations, arbitrations, depositions, hearings. And I, I say unfortunately because my brain got used to it. And um, eventually just a little bit led to a lot. And um, I, I, I lost everything. I lost my career. I uh, lost my, my marriage. Almost lost my children. Um, I had a a big house and memorial. um, Had everything that that I ever planned on having and lost it all. And then I'm at the Mayo Clinic and I I see the doctor. He looks at me, this is Mr. Dr. Hamilton, and he says, "Um, your condition is too far gone. There's nothing I can do for you. And let me ask you this. You said that earlier. They said the guy at the Mayo Clinic or the doctor at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Hamilton, was the only doctor that could help you with your condition. Right. What had they diagnosed you with? At that point, I had a major uh, destruction of my sinuses okay. from all the cocaine use. It was not just a deviated septum. It was no septum. Okay. And my uh, terminates were destroyed. I was, com- I was constantly nauseous and vomiting. Anytime I drank anything, anything I ate anything. I had major gastric reflux. I, I was bleeding internally. Uh, it was really bad. And I couldn't, I, it was hard to breathe. I couldn't speak very well. Um, and also my, I had my orthopedic injuries, so it was difficult to walk. So I was there to see him for my ENT reconstruction. Mm-hmm. And um, so I start thinking, uh, like a lawyer, how can I convince him? See, one of my egos, uh, my identity was I was able to persuade people to do things and say things they don't want to say or do, like in court, witnesses. So I try to start coming up with an argument to convince him to fix me. Of course he can fix me. And this is instantaneous, but my brain is is doing this. And then then I start thinking, how did I get to this point? Mm-hmm. How did I get to a point where I was this college athlete? I was always healthy. I was a, a father of two, softball coach, little league coach, soccer coach. Um, I had a, this you know, successful law practice. How did I get to the point to be where the top doctor in the world can't fix my particular medical problem? Did you ever answer that question? I was starting to tear up. Mm-hmm. And then he said, but we have an addiction program here at the Mayo Clinic. Would you like my help? My tears started flowing more. And I said, yes, please. 
That was the first time I, as I say now, surrendered. Mm-hmm. I asked for accepted help. I asked and accepted help. So that's one thing that took me a long time to do. I had been seeing doctors in Houston for about a year. I knew I was an addict and I needed help. But I was, had too much shame to admit mm-hmm. it. I had too much fear. I, I thought that my condition was hopeless. I, th- I was convinced. This is, I was in so much denial that my drug changed brain was rationalizing to the point of saying, you can never get sober or clean unless your pain is resolved first. Because I believed I was using for my pain. Mm. Because it, and, but now, just fast forwarding, we can talk about more of the details. I still have a fractured back. I still have all the same orthopedic injuries. I'm walking 11,000 steps a day. I'm hiking m- mountains. I'm playing golf. And I have no pain. And you're not doing drugs. Right. And you're not drinking. I'm not drinking. I'm not drugging. I'm not smoking. I'm not eating sugar. I completely changed my diet and my lifestyle. And uh, you're here today. And I'm here today. That's right. To well, that's a wonderful yeah, story. And so one thing that's important to me is now I know there are a lot of lawyers who are living happy, joyous, and free lives without drinking or drugging, um, six very successful lives. But I didn't know them mm-hmm. when I needed them. Mm-hmm. Now I, uh, so now I know people that were sober years ago when I needed them, but I didn't know they were sober mm-hmm. because so many people keep it anonymous. Right. And uh, so that's one reason I like to be very loud about it. Because if somebody is in this horrible place, it's not hopeless. It's not helpless. You just have to ask. And it doesn't discriminate. You're right. It doesn't discriminate. <laughs> all ages, all colors, all genders. I mean, it, it hits everybody. All socioeconomic levels. I mean, the richest of the rich and the poor of the poor. Everybody is prone to face addiction issues. The common denominators are all human. Mm-hmm. But we all have different, I, I call it predispositions. Right. I was predisposed to become addicted to coke and opioids. Somebody else may be predisposed to get addicted to nicotine or sugar or gaming Mm -hmm. or social media. Mm -hmm. We all have different predispositions based based on what we're exposed to. Our work. Yes. I was a workaholic. Mm -hmm. I was a studentaholic. I was a sportsaholic. You're right. Actually, uh, tennis was my outlet for most of the years. Uh, I'd finish work. Uh, five, six, seven o'clock at night, and I'd say I have to go exercise because of the stress. Yeah. I go ride bike, or I go work out, or I go play tennis. After I hurt my back real bad, I didn't have that outlet. I needed another outlet, and mm. unfortunately, I didn't have the community, a healthy community, to help me find a, another outlet. Did you ever have anybody come up to you? And this has been one of the things I've been thinking about and talking to everybody about the Stop the Stigma initiative. Did anyone? Any of your colleagues or any of the judiciary or any of your opponents come up to you and say, are you okay? You need help? Do you need help? Or, oh, are you okay? Maybe you need to consider rehab or, or anything like that? I, I never had a judge do that. Um, I had a, um, a judge ask me, Paul, are you okay? But if I, I just lied, said, yeah. Yeah. And then it let, that was all there is to it. Um, I had a colleague that would call me up and say, Paul, are you okay? And then I would say, yeah, I lied, but never a follow-up uh, that may have changed. Um, That's what I'm wondering, like at what point, cause you know, I think you know my story. Mm-hmm. Um, I won't talk about it too much cause it makes me a little weepy, but that was the one thing I always said, like, what if I could, you know, my goal this year is just to save one life. But how do we give people the tools to do that? Because you can tell when someone's not okay. If you're close to someone, you can tell when they're not okay, either mentally or maybe they're over, overusing substances. What did you think would have helped you maybe realize you probably, and ov- obviously this is all speculation, you know, everything happened exactly the way it was supposed to be and you're sitting here today and you're healthy and that's wonderful. But looking back, what do you think could have happened that maybe would have helped you realize uh, your problem and gotten help sooner? 
I think if a lawyer that I respect and trust came up to me and says, Paul, I've been where you're at, and there's a way out, and shared their experience, strength, and hope with me, I may have seen there's a way out and not felt as uh, ashamed yeah, um, and afraid. I mean, that's the truth is there's a lot of shame around it. But the reality is, and I, I quoted this last week, and I'm going to get this quote and put it on this table so it's, I get it right every time. But I love Brene Brown, uh, talks a lot about shame. But the one thing she says, you know, when the, we're all human and we all have struggles. And when we're in the middle of our struggles, the last thing we need is shame. And that's the one thing is I want people to understand, you know, we are all human. We all experience some sort of stress in our life, grief, death, you know, mental health issues. I mean, all of the things. And so learning, you know, to let go of the shame and be able to say, you know, I need help is huge. Or helping someone else who's going through that crisis maybe not feel the shame. So then when you say help, they can say, yes, I need help. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, there's a difference between guilt and shame, right? Guilt is when you feel badly about what you did, but, not, but shame is when you think you're a bad person. Bad person. And um, I felt being a trial lawyer that uh, can't show up anymore, I felt shame. And uh, I felt I didn't want anyone to know. See, this is something that I, uh, I agree with you. I was at a place when... I didn't want my clients to know that I needed help Mm -hmm. because they may fire me. Mm -hmm. I was afraid. I didn't want other plaintiff lawyers to know because they may try to steal my clients. Paul's not capable. Mm -hmm. I didn't want the adversaries, uh, defense lawyers to know. They'll use it against me. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, and I was afraid to call the bar that they'll take my license. That's right. And I wasn't, I was ignorant about TLAP. Actually, uh, someone from TLAP called me about eight years ago, seven years ago, 2017, um, and left me a voice message, and I called back and lied. I'm fine. But then when I was in rehab, when I'm on the other side, so to speak, I reached out to TLAP and asked for help, and TLAP did a great job helping me get into, I actually called the Minnesota Lawyers Assistance Program also. So... When I said yes, please, to that doctor, the next day I met with the psychiatrist uh, at the Mayo Clinic about their addiction program. And I shared with him honestly that I'm afraid that I have this medical, these medical problems that I need surgery. I may need a total back reconstruction because of the fractured back. And I was afraid if I go to rehab and get sober and clean and then have major surgery and get opioids again, I'd relapse. Mm-hmm. Or do I get the major surgery now, get it over with, and then six months later go to rehab or whenever I'm out? Oh, I didn't know which mm-hmm. came first, a chicken or the egg. So they said, we'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they said? Yes. Yeah, so, so a week later, I got a phone call for that next week. This is something that's interesting. Over the next week, I went to those six doctor appointments, this, that various specialists. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I've never had anyone say this to me before or since, but all those doctors said the same thing. They must have seen the fear in my eyes, in my body. They said, Paul, you're in a safe place. I didn't know I needed to be in a safe place, but that helped me eventually. They called me about a week later and said, we have a spot for you in our inpatient residential program. Um, In Minnesota? In Minnesota. Okay. So I admitted myself into the psychiatric hospital, their residential program, and I spent 30 days there. And then we can talk more about it, but then I admitted myself after that to their um, intensive outpatient program for 30 days, and then to their relapse prevention program for 45 days, and then to their recovery maintenance program for 45 days. I eventually stayed there almost a year. That's what I wanted to talk to you about, too, and and I guess maybe now's the time since you mentioned relapse. Um, That's another thing that that sometimes is so hard for people to realize is just because you get clean one time doesn't mean you're not going to have a slip or a relapse because you're human, right? Um, And and then oftentimes it just gets right back into the same, you know, um, the same sort of behaviors. 
Um, talk to me about what was rehab like for you at what point, or do you even recall like when you had this epiphany, you know, gosh, I was really sick and, and a lot of what ailed me was a result of excessive use. Yeah. Well, I recognized that my body was, uh, I was sick mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I didn't know about the spiritual component until I got into recovery. And it's, a, it's been an amazing journey for me. And there's a part of, uh, recovery that talks about your physical, emotional uh, maladies will be resolved once your spiritual malady is res- resolved. So obviously I changed my lifestyle, but I still have those injuries, but uh, I, have a, uh, I try to stay spiritually fit, which I'm convinced helps my, my pain. Uh, but for me, I'm convinced of several things from my experience. Einstein once said, we become the product of the five people we spend most of our time when I was spending time with, with very aggressive, uh, you might say, jerks, I was, I was a, a very aggressive j- jerk. Um, when I try to spend time with people that are loving and kind, I'm becoming more loving, and kind. loving and kind. That's right. Um, one thing, you know, they talk up. you've been in the recovery programs and I've been in the recovery programs in a different light, but they talk about when you're in the throes of addiction or when you're walking along someone who's in the throes of addiction, they are 100% leaving, living out of their ego. Yeah. Um, so I, there's a part of, of uh, the recovery program that talks about trying to be useful again. My ego wanted to be useful, wanted to win lawsuits, help people. And then I got to a point where I, I felt useless. Um, and so, but I also, also recall, I don't know if this is on point, no matter how much, how much I won a tennis match or a trial, I always was dissatisfied. I could have done better. Your inner voice. Inner voice. I could have won more. If I was more prepared, if I did this, I could have won more games. I could have, whatever. It was never satisfied. I feel now, like that's such a character still- trait of attorneys. You know, like we're the perfectionists, we're the type, type A's. You know, and the other thing is we're also the helpers. We want to help everybody else, and we don't want to help ourselves. I thought I was helping myself. My, I had a best friend who said, this is right before I started the taking opioids and changing my brain, uh, that he said I was the most balanced person he knew. I, I, I was a Little League coach, soccer coach. I went out with my friends. I played tennis. I was active at home. I, I had a full practice. But then... Just one thing happened that put, changed my whole thing, and I became so um, self-centered. You know, that's the that's what, the difference between my recovery and, and my my addiction was. Now I'm more um, uh, service-oriented than self-oriented, and that's a big, big change. Big change, yeah. But you're talking about relapse, and I, I'm convinced that relapse is is due to, is not necessary as part of the the pro process it's if if i'm not all in if i haven't sat all the way down if i still have reservations about if i still identify as an alcohol a drinker who wants to stop drinking it's going to be hard for me to stop drinking or if i identify as a smoker uh, who wants to stop smoking i had to identify as a person in recovery And then I act like a person in recovery. You don't go to bars. I don't go to bars. I don't go to liquor stores. Um, I I go hiking. I I hang out with people. Yes, exactly. And that goes back to your community, right? Right. As you're talking, I'm hearing like maybe you lost your tennis community when you hurt your back. Uh, Was that a tennis-related injury? Yeah, it, 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 it was both. I had a ski accident that, that injured my back, and then I was playing tennis, and I was jumping for a U, uh, overhead, and I um, got a, to- an, it's called an avulsion of my hamstring, which not more, it popped the hamstring. So I had a combination of the fractured back and the torn hamstring, uh, or the avulsion of the hamstring, and um, it was, you know, extremely, extremely painful and limiting. So, yes, I... Physically, but then, you know, emotionally, you lost your outlet, you yeah, know? I, I, yeah, I lost my emotional outlet, my stress outlet, and my kids were going out to college. I was de- didn't know that, but I got depression. They don't need me anymore. And I, that was so much 
uh, a lie, but that's what I told myself. My son's 33, my daughter's 31. They still need me. Need you, yeah. Yeah, but I'm I, sure they're glad you're here. Yes. My son and daughter did a great, my son went to Al-Anon before I went to AA. Oh, nice. Before I went to rehab. Yeah. And he used some Al-Anon uh, techniques that helped me go get help. We met for lunch and I, I showed up impaired. And he sent me a text that at the time I thought were mean. How dare <laughs> they were just you, boundaries, how I'm dare sure. you speak to your son like your father like this? <laughs> yeah, young man, I, I I'm <laughs> and um but uh in hindsight I in hindsight it was probably all true, you know. But he said he didn't want to speak with me or see me until I got clean. So I love you talking about Al Anon. I'm a grateful member of Al Anon for eleven years now. So I I truly believe and before we started this. The 12 steps, I really think they should teach it in middle school. You know, I feel like if we would teach kids all these steps to finding peace with ourselves and overcoming struggles and, you know, not facing challenges with so much emotion, um, it's life changing, you know. And, and once your, the people in your system start to change, um, it, it can be the impetus for other people to change. Well, I had contempt prior to investigation. I was anti-12 steps. I didn't want to go to a 12-step program. I looked at rehabs for about a year, uh, but I wanted to find a perfect program because my, I was so ignorant. Like I said, I didn't know anybody in Al-Anon or in AA. Um, I didn't, I've never been to one. And so um, my ignorance was strong and my contempt prior to investigation was strong. And so I looked into rehabs. Um, like I said, my son helped me look for programs, but I wanted, I didn't want to have chronic pain. I didn't want to have to accept I'm going to be in pain the rest of my life. I wanted a, a treatment for, I, I, I was convinced there was a cause of my pain. And in hindsight, it was my drugs. It, it, was, it was causing uh, rebound pain. A lot of people, uh, uh, pain medication, one of the side effects is pain. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. And there's a lot of other medications that, that, are, are, that you use to treat a condition, but one of their side effects is to cause the same symptoms that it causes. So you don't know whether or not. And so, so you're you, creating a vicious cycle. Bingo. Bingo. And then that could be life-changing. Or it could kill you. <laughs> yes. You know? I mean, that ultimately, and, and when you were talking earlier, I was busy listening, but in my mind, you were saying you were doing all these things. You were being the dad, and you were going to the games, and you were trying cases and playing tennis. Uh, and then the more you started doing the drugs, you were doing more and more and more, but you were still operating. You know, and people call that, I'm a functioning alcoholic. I'm a functioning drug addict. And I always say, only for a little while. <laughs> it's a myth. It's not true. It's not true. Yeah. No, because when I was uh, being, uh, I, I once saw a, a doctor. He was a head, he was a chief of the ICU at St. Luke's Hospital in Houston. And he said to me, Paul, you're the most functional addict I've ever met. And my reaction was, yes, <laughs> <laughs> I, I did it. I can, <laughs> I, can, I can do drugs and be successful and all at the same time. And it was, I was so sick. Uh, but I didn't realize how I was affecting my family. Mm -hmm. my, I, I wasn't the lawyer I could have been. Uh, I wasn't the friend I, they deserved. I wasn't the husband my ex-wife now deserved. Mm -hmm. uh, my kids deserved my attention, and I wasn't there for them. They call it a family disease, and it truly does impact anyone who, has, who is in that close proximity with the person who is in active addiction. And, you know, it... it and in and, and a lot of ways, it can permanently impact it because uh, you, like for me, I've been in Al-Anon for 11 years because I have to go through recovery myself to recover from the trauma that we experience through that experience. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So my, my daughter, it was instrumental in my recovery as well. She didn't go to Al-Anon, but she kept showing love to me when no one else would. And so... When I went to eventually a rehab, um, um, the psychiatrist had asked me, I was about, uh, by the way, speaking of Brene Brown, I was uh, about a week into rehab, and I thought I, I was doing great. I wanted an A as being in, in rehab. And I went up to my counselor. I said, how am I doing? He goes, you need to work on your vulnerability. 
<laughs> you need to read Brene Brown. And I, my first reaction was, why and would I want to work on vulnerability? I was so confused. I thought that was a weakness. Well, because in this profession, you got to admit, I mean, sometimes I think it's silly that the general public puts us on such a pedestal because we're just humans, but they do. And to admit we're vulnerable may, may do all the things you're talking about. May We may lose clients. But then again, when you get to a place of peace, you realize if people are going to leave me because I'm vulnerable, that I don't need those people in my life anyway, right? I want the clients who want me for being authentic and being who I am and saying that, you know, I'm in, you know, in recovery or I've been through these difficult situations. And, you know, I mean, th- at least that's where I've kind of gotten is I'm okay with it. I admire lawyers like you that are willing to be rigorously honest and be authentic uh, I, I had too much fear about that. I always had a mask. Well, I, I've had my mask. <laughs> I haven't always been this way. I used to tell people, I mean, it wasn't, you know, violent, but I would tell people in the front of our house looked like that almost famous movie, you know, where, or not almost famous, but I can't remember the name of the movie. It was Kevin Spacey and somebody else, but she had these beautiful roses and this white picket fence in the front yard. And then when you open the front door, it was like the first scene of Saving Private Ryan. I mean, no, without like the warfare and the fighting, but it was just truly just chaos, you know, mental chaos all the time. So it takes a while um, to do it and, you know, to take the step and ask for help. And that's what I did in April of, you know, 2013. I went in just to see what it was about and it changed my life. Good you know, you. I'm, I'm glad you had the courage to do that. I wish I did earlier. So one thing that I've learned to go back on relapse for a second is Robin Williams was interviewed some years ago. He'd gone in and out of rehabs. And he says his experience, he'd been in some of the most expensive top rehabs with some of the top CEOs of the world. He said he noticed the people that succeeded, who got sober and stayed sober, were the people that he called truly intelligent, not the people who just thought they were intelligent. He said, the same, he said people that are truly intelligent are willing to ask and accept help. They want to change. The people who think they're intelligent think they know it all. They don't need to change. And uh, so I was one of those. Uh, I'm glad I, I went from thinking I'm intelligent to hopefully being <laughs> truly. <laughs> so did you read a Brene Brown book? I have. I've read two of her books, and I, I watched her, her, some of her Podcast. podcasts and her, her TED Talk. And that helped change my life. I was maybe five, four, five months sober when I first started following her. And I didn't know she was in, in, recovery. in, in recovery. Yeah, she was vocal about it. Um, so when you were in treatment, what was the most in, impactful aspect of your treatment that you recall? Like, what do you, what do you recall as being, wow, this this is my turning point, or this really changed me, or this really made me think. What happened in in treatment that made you kind of do an about face? Well, a couple things. One is I had this experience. Um, That's a good question. I was meeting with a non-denominational chaplain at the Mayo Clinic, Um, and I was really struggling because at the, end, at the very end of my using, um, my mother died, and I wasn't capable of being present for her. I wasn't the son she deserved. And I was having a lot of guilt. guilt. I wasn't able to grieve because I was too uh, sick. And um, so I want to talk to the chaplain about that. And um, he said that um, he talked to me for a while. And then he said, do you want to pray? And I hadn't prayed in a long, long time. And when I did pray, I didn't really know how to pray. I have a whole new approach to a prayer. Now I pray and meditate every morning as part of my spiritual fitness program. And so uh, he held my hands and we kind of prayed. And then I left the, the little library where we had met. The way the Mayo Clinic is set up, it's like a spoke of a wheel. The nurse's station is in the middle, and then there's the, a library and a cafeteria next to the nurse's station. And all the patients' rooms are down the hall, like spokes of a wheel. And so 
uh, the policy there was no, no cell phones in common areas for p- privacy. So we had to keep our phones in our rooms. The rooms had no locks on the doors. Um, the, the place got locked down like a prison at 9 o'clock every night. We weren't allowed. We didn't get it back by 9. We couldn't get in, and we couldn't get out. Uh, and so, and the phone, my phone was always muted because I didn't want to disturb other patients. So I walk out of the, the, the room with the chaplain. I walk down the hall into my room. As soon as I open the door to my bedroom, my phone rang. And I said, why is my phone ringing? It's supposed to be on mute. And it was a number that I didn't recognize. And back then, I didn't answer numbers that I didn't recognize. Now I, I do don't do it today time. either. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but for some reason, I answered the phone. And it said, are you in need of urgent prayer? I got goosebumps. The phone just fell out of my hand onto the bed. And I have not had that phone call since, nor before. And... I talked to the chaplain about it. What does it mean? And he didn't have a good answer. But I felt it meant that I'm at the right place at the right time. I'm doing what I need to do to heal myself. Mm -hmm. And I I made a more committed, uh, more of a commitment to my recovery at that point in time. Talk to me about, and you talked about this a little bit earlier, but how has your life changed since you have entered recovery, I didn't count up how long you said you were, you, you went through the original rehab and then you went to extensive outpatient and then you went to, what was the third one? Well, they have, they have acronyms, but essentially I went to intensive outpatient for seven months Uh, and it was a step down five days a week to three days a week to two days a week to one day a week. And during that whole process, I started getting involved in AA meetings, NA meetings. I also had a, a counselor that suggested to me to experiment, you know. And then I started thinking, I'm going to apply, I'm going to experiment with recovery, but I'm going to put 110% or 100% F into it uh, like I did with tennis or with law. I'm going to, I'm just, because you never know if you can, it's going to work until you work it. I was about to say, I'm sitting here thinking it works if you work it, right? right. That's our slogan. <laughs> right. So I had to put the effort in. If it didn't work, then I'll try something else. Right. But I, I didn't, I, so I really put effort into it. And then I started experimenting um, while doing all this, while doing all this uh, outpatient rehab, I continued seeing all the other doctors, getting my pain situation, seeing physical therapists, um, a physical medicine specialist, orthopedic surgeons, GI specialist. And eventually, five months later, the doctor said he couldn't fix me. Fix me. He agreed to operate. I, I know now he didn't want to operate on a drug addict. Well, not to mention, I mean, just I have witnessed what someone looks like in the throes of addiction and you're not very healthy. Yeah, right. You good might point. not recover. A good point. Yeah. Good point. So he eventually operated on me. And he, we talked about it. I told him it was very, I started being very honest with everybody. I'm in recovery. I had all these problems. For the first time in my life, I was not afraid of a paper trail. Because yeah. I would, like I said, I was seeing doctors in Houston, but I wouldn't, I would lie. I didn't want their, I knew about subpoena power. Yeah. <laughs> well, want, you were doing PI work, so <laughs> that's all we look at, right? Medical records. <laughs> right. So I know. So I didn't want there to be anything in my records. So I would lie and didn't want anything. So anyway, so I started being a very honest. And so I said, I had a problem with opioids. Um, you, you, your records say you're going to prescribe oxycodone and cotton, and I, I don't want to get addicted again. So I had fear. And he, he, I went to see an addictionologist at the Mayo Clinic, and she said, two of the top three causes of relapse for professionals is pain and pain medication. Um, and I was going to have one or both. Um, and so, um, I was planning, so he did the major reconstruction surgery. He essentially lifted my nose off my face and totally reconstructed it. He uh, did a, uh, incision in my chest and re- went into my ribs and took a lot of cartilage from my ribs. So I had like a four inch scar in my chest. And so I had a lot of bandages and pain and scar. I wake up planning to have 
uh, pain meds because I was afraid. Um, when I wake up at the foot of my bed, I see a woman from my uh, therapy sessions smiling at me, a woman in recovery. That smile is what I still remember. I don't remember the pain, although I know I was in a lot of pain. Her smile gave me the strength to say no. I, I spent, I just had Tylenol and a leave for my pain uh, without any narcotics or opioids. And now I'm convinced there's a drug in your brain called oxytocin not OxyContin. It's the love chemical or the connection chemical. That's why fellowship is so important to me. So important to everybody, whether they recognize it or not. Community is, is very important. Yeah. And so I had to drop my excessive self-reliance disorder. And I didn't ask her to be there. She came. But she, her smile is what gave me the strength. And then she helped get somebody else to come wheel me to my my up my hotel up across the street and then somebody else came hours later to change my bandages and bring balloons over the next week i would be bandaged and people would take me to aa meetings and i'd show up in meetings all bandaged uh, and the love from the group uh kept me that i was able to just do tylenol i still can't explain it pretty amazing yeah well that that's the it works if you work it right that's what that program's about and that's, I guess, part of me, the philosophy of it is, you know, I, I do, you were talking earlier about how so many people in recovery keep it a secret because they're afraid of the shame or, or whatever that's going to come from it. But it's important to share the journey of recovery. So, or even, you know, the thoughts of maybe going to the recovery so that we know who you are and we'll be there. You know what I mean? We, I, I say all the time, I will drop whatever I'm doing. If you tell me that you need help, I will be there. It's funny you say that. When I was practicing law, if a client would call me after hours, I'd say, I'd have a voice message, call me during regular hours. I wouldn't take the call. Or um, I'd take it if it's a big case, right? But not if it's a regular call. But now, if someone calls me at two in the morning, I answer it. Because something's wrong. It's some, that they may need help. They need and help. I, and I may be able... So you've heard the story about... Um, person in a d deep dark well and can't get out have you heard that before mm. no tell me that okay so there's a story about a, a person's in a deep dark well and they've been trying to get out on their own for years they've gone to some doctors they've gone to clergy they try to get ladders to get out but they are are stuck they can't get out finally someone jumps into that deep dark well with them and they say oh my god now you're stuck here i've been down here for years how you, we're both going to be here and the, the person smiles and says, no, I've been here before. I'm going to show you the way, way out. out. I love that. And so I've been in the deep, dark well of, a, of several addictions, of depression. Um, I, was, I had suicidal ideation. So I can get into uh, some deep, dark wells with people. And I'm grateful for those opportunities. That's why I think it's important to have this discussion in the podcast and with the magazine and in the bar association. So people understand that these are normal struggle, struggles that people face every single day. And there's a way out. Well, here working at T-Lab, I get exposed to lots of lawyers who need help. Unfortunately, not as many lawyers call for help and ask for help as I wish they would. You know, statistically, uh, 20 to 30 percent of all lawyers in the United States have a substance use disorder. And I think that's underreported. You know, I think so, too. And I think, you know, too, when you think about all the reasons, you know, you're afraid to lose your bar license, you're afraid your colleagues or not your colleagues, but well, you might you're afraid your firm's going to fire you, mm -hmm. you know, or you're afraid somebody's going to take advantage of you or you're afraid your referral next network will go away. I mean, there's a it's legitimate fear. Right. But there's so much power in saying, I think, you know, and you don't realize it at the time I need help and walking through recovery, you become a better person. I think, you know, you obviously do than when you were, you know, using are in the throes of, of your crisis. Um, but no, I totally agree with that. Um, so what's the biggest adjustment you've had to make um, in your recovery journey, in your life? What's the biggest adjustment you had to make in your life? Well, um, I have, uh, obviously now I have a relationship with my kids that I didn't have before. My son who didn't want to see me again, now uh, we spend a lot of time together. 
Uh, my son and daughter and I just came back from Yosemite. We went hiking. Um, we get together and play golf regularly. And so the recovery has healed our relationships, although I still have to make living amends with them every day. But one of the biggest adjustments for me is I, this is, this is just me. I know a lot of lawyers who, after they get into recovery, they get the tools of a community, they get the tools of the steps, they get other tools on how to live life on life's terms. They go back to practicing law and they're more productive, more successful than other lawyers because other lawyers don't have the same tools. That's right. They have to drink or drug or smoke or do something to deal with the stress. They don't have a healthy community. Uh, but for me, I didn't want to go back to, to, to the grind of being a trial lawyer. So I, was, I had to just work on myself, try to change myself. And so after about three years of, of recovery, uh, and, and I started experimenting with Buddhism, Stoicism, shamanism, <laughs> Hinduism, <laughs> cognitive behavioral therapy, rational motive behavioral therapy, smart recovery, dharma recovery. I started doing all that. <laughs> I, I found a common denominator is based on thousands of years of ancient wisdom, and it made me more committed to the steps because I found the foundation of it all, and that helped me. So then about three years into my journey, uh, the State Bar of Texas, who once prosecuted me, I didn't share this, I was suspended. Well, you did say you lost your practice, and I didn't ask any questions, but thank you for sharing that. I was curious. Yeah, so what happened was I lost my practice because I stopped taking new cases, and I got suspended. Um, I, I stopped showing up. I stopped returning calls. I isolated the disease of one of isolation. Um, uh, I, I had a... Uh, most of the cases that were filed against me... Um, were not meritorious, but I never showed up. I, I had default judgments against me, so I got suspended. And then um, I didn't respond to the bar. And I don't know if anyone knows this, the bar doesn't like it when you don't respond to the bar. It's an ethical violation to not respond to the bar. You kind of signed an oath to respond to the bar. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Just so, one of those little things, you know, right? So I eventually was able to prove that the underlying allegations, the grievances were false, but it, I had to acknowledge that my non-response was a violation. So my, I got suspended for a couple of years. Um, and that's what, what, that was either, that was also one of those things that maybe was a blessing in disguise because while I was suspended, I re went to rehab and took care of myself and healed. And then I came back and the, the institution, the State Bar of Texas that prosecuted me, that sued me, asked me to come work for them. Uh, to try to come work for TLAP, the Texas Law Assistance Program. And my, and one reason I think that happened is to answer your question, my attitude of entitlement and my attitude of resentment changed to an attitude of gratitude. I started feeling grateful, and it was demonstrated, and now I'm grateful to the State Bar of Texas. Yeah, it will, attitude of gratitude will 100% change your life. You just got to get there. It's hard to get there. That is a great story. Oh, my gosh, that's wonderful. And so you work with TLAP now. Talk to me a little bit about what your role is with TLAP. Well, it's multi, multi-factorial. So one thing I do is I take calls for lawyers who need help. So if, if you want to stop drinking, stop drugging, or if you have a mental health issue, um, you call us confidentially by statute, um, and then we can help you with resources. Um, although three of us are mental health professionals, I'm the only one in recovery. Um, some of, some of them have uh, family issues. Some of them are in Al-Anon or, or, or t adult children of alcoholics. But, uh, and so we help them find mental health support or, or, or help them find peer support. So there's almost 1,000 lawyers in Texas that are in recovery who have signed contracts of confidentiality with Texas, with TLAP. And so if you call up and you're, you're in any part, Houston, El Paso, anywhere, uh, Dallas, Austin, and you want to change. You want to stop drinking, you want to stop drugging, you want to stop overeating or smoking um, or gaming, and you can call us and we can help find somebody who's been there, done that to confidentially help you, work with you. And that's pretty unique. I didn't know that existed. And that's what one thing that helped save my life was I was in Minnesota and I called the Minnesota Assistance Program 
they had a lawyer drive two hours from Owatonna, Minnesota, to Rochester, Minnesota, to meet me at the cafeteria at the hospital. And him and I are still great friends. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, you know, so I use that service, but not as a lawyer suffering with substance abuse, but as a spouse of a lawyer suffering with substance abuse. So I called TLAP, and they were such a great resource for us. And we got connected with a lawyer in Texas. Um, I, I'm not going to mention his name. He everybody he tells everybody his story, but I'm not going to tell everybody his story. But uh, And he was incredible and, and walked with us through our journey um, until the very end. Yeah, so TLAP really does uh, help. And I like to tell people that, too, is you don't have to be the lawyer going through crisis. You could be the lawyer... Uh, and be the spouse of someone going through a crisis, and TLAP would be there to help you. We, we help an entire family, and also the, fam the, the law firm family. So if a legal assistant or a secretary or office manager, if they're having trouble or if one of their lawyers is having trouble, call us confidentially. We have, a, we have a trust fund that's unique to lawyers, law students, and judges, as you know, and we can talk about that. But in addition to helping lawyers, law students, and judges, we do public speaking. So if your law firm wants us to come talk, share my, I can share my story. We can talk about our resources. Uh, we go to CLEs. We go to symposiums. We go to summits. We're going to all the law school orientations to uh, try to get the law lawyers before their lawyers. Yeah, yeah. Well, so when you were saying that, I want to make sure the, the listener understands that. So, for example, let's say one of my partner's um, maybe having an issue and I called TLAP and said, Hey, my partner, I think is really struggling. Do you mind reaching out that my partner would never know that I made a call to TLAP. They would, you know, so then it becomes, that's the opportunity. Hopefully that when someone reaches out to them, that they will say I need help or they will help understand that they need help. But I was at the TLAP 35th anniversary <laughs> and my favorite part of the video is somebody, I forgot who it was, says there's a lot of times when you go into the, office and or call somebody on the phone and say I, I think you you know you might need some help or I heard you you might be struggling and somebody will say I don't know what the hell you're talking about mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know it does That's what, take, that was me yeah I'm fine I don't, I don't you know <laughs> yeah but I do think you know it's important to not be afraid to make that call to TLAP you know not be afraid to help your colleagues or not be afraid to help yourself yeah AA for me now stands for ask and accept help yes I love that ask and accept and that was hard for me. But yeah, we, so if you call for, for a colleague or a friend or another lawyer, um, yeah, it's confidential. And then we can't even tell you what, if anything, we do. But we have peer support and peer outreach. Uh, peer support is if a lawyer uh, yourself calls us for help, we can help match you. Peer outreach, if a third person like yourself calls for a colleague, then if we think the circumstances are, are appropriate, we can have a lawyer or lawyers in your community uh, go out and talk with you like I wish somebody did to me. Right. You know, and when you're saying that, I was thinking, you know, if you have concerns about somebody, call. you can probably call TLAP as many times as you think you need to, right? Because it may take more than one time to, to get, help somebody get some help or, or have the courage to ask for help, which is a very courageous move. Yeah, you know, like I said, it's hard to always I understand you know, like, for example, I was having symptoms of major depressive disorder, but also could have been opioid use disorder. It's hard to separate. You can have a metabolic disorder that you just need your thyroid checked, potentially, and your behavior can change. So sometimes you're, you're not calling to complain, you're calling to help. Um, so talk to me about what would you say to somebody who was Paul in, I guess, 2017? Uh, who was saying, I don't need help, and I'm fine, and, and all of that, what would you say to somebody in that position that's listening to this podcast that needs help? What would you tell them to do? That's a great question. Um, well, I want to let them know how wonderful recovery is, because I was also ignorant about it. I thought my life would be the same. I would still be in pain. I would still be depressed, but I wouldn't be drinking. I, didn't have a, I wouldn't have a, an alternative solution. There's alternative solutions. There's healthy community. There's, um, um, uh, there's a change of, uh, of, of relationships. My relationships are so much healthier, so much real. Um, 
and I, I wish I was aware of how wonderful my life would have been if I had gotten help sooner. They become your family. Yes. You know, so when I, um, this might make me cry, um, so I'll try not to. <laughs> but when I went through my crisis in 2023, my, my Al-Anon family was there, you know, just doing things for me that I didn't know I needed, you know, so that, that, and you know, that sometimes people think you got to really rely on your family of origin, but truly when you come into this family of recovery, um, they, it's such a service oriented organization that people will just stop and help you and they love you, you know, without any, expecting anything in return. It is just pure love. It was, it's amazing. I remember, I'm getting goosebumps remembering this. It wasn't significant, but I went to some, a meeting in Minnesota for a couple months. And most of the time I shared, I was pontificating. I was wearing my mask. I was trying to show off because I was so insecure and afraid. And finally, I said something real one day. I don't remember what I said, but I was authentic. An old timer came up to me afterwards and he said, Paul, it's finally good to get to know you. And, I, I, and I'm going, wow, somebody really wants to know me. Somebody really cares. Somebody really cared. And yeah. Um, so here's a real quick funny story. I know you have another question. I was at, in treatment, and uh, they asked me about my, my family, and I said, my, um, my daughter lives in Austin, and my son lives in Houston at the time. He had come back from, he was studying for the bar. Um, and um, they said, well, are they going to come visit you? And I said, that's a long way away. I don't think so. And then they wrote on my records, no family support. Uh, and I had a resentment. That was my first amends to the counselor who wrote No Family Support. I found out there's a Houston, Minnesota, and an Austin, Minnesota, 20 minutes from the hospital. <laughs> and they're thinking, yeah, the kids aren't even going to go 20 minutes oh, to see Oh, they him. were thinking you were from Minnesota. <laughs> right. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, anyway. Substance abuse disorder is a progressive disease. We talked about that. What we mean by that, and just like you said, is you know, maybe it'll start off with, say, one wine, a glass, or one glass of wine a night. And then the next thing you know, you're drinking a bottle of wine a night. Or let's just do a little bit of cocaine. And the next thing you know, you're doing a whole lot of cocaine. And of course, the more you do, the more, the more money you spend and the less you can function. And, and it eventually becomes not so functioning. You know, it takes over you. Um, what would you say about recovery? Because I kind of feel like recovery is also progressive. Do you agree with that? Yes. So for me, as part of my progressive disease, it was not just the, um, the alcohol and drugs, but my uh, self-centeredness. I mean, they say that the root cause of drinking and drugging is the egocentricity. Mm -hmm. In fact, they discuss narcissism in the blue book, don't they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think my, like I said, my excessive self-reliance disorder grew. Um, how, especially the more isolated I became. So I, I, I built a firm of like 30 lawyers and then through attrition, it got down to just me. My staff kept leaving and it, then I had to do more of myself and I wasn't capable. Um, but disease is one of isolation. And so my self-centeredness got grew. So I, I think now, like I said, I am so much more willing to ask for help. I'm also so much more willing to follow a group of drunks. I'm more willing to follow good orderly direction, you know, and, and um, as a result of that, my life has turned around. So uh, five and a half years ago, I'm in Minnesota. I'm living in a motel. All my furniture is in storage in Houston. My car's in Houston. My career is gone. I'm suspended. I have, my marriage is over. My kids are 1,200 miles away. My, I don't have any friends left because I felt they abandoned me. But in hindsight, I, my disease separated myself. And I'm seeing a therapist, and we start talking about happiness. And she said, happiness can't be in the future because otherwise it's always going to be. The next best thing. It's, it, you have to be happy in the present moment. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, it's always going to be. If, if this happens or when this happens. And so um, 
I'm in this place where I don't, I don't have a job, like I said. I don't have anybody in my life. Uh, and I reflected. I go, I'm happy. How do you explain that? I was truly happy. And I remember Viktor Frankl said in uh, Man's Search for Meaning, happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue as a result of doing something meaningful. And I felt my recovery was meaningful. And I was happy. It was interesting. And today, I have a wonderful woman in my life. My, she's my life partner. I found her in the program. I said my relationship with my kids are great. I'm actually friends with my ex-wife. And did you make amends? I made amends. I made amends to all my, my kids. Well, my first amends was to the counselor for having a resentment. And I told you that. And then, um, uh, then I started making amends. First time I made amends, my daughter was instrumental and bringing my ex-wife and myself back to together. So um, I was a, I was a um, uh, I went from being, I thought, a really great father and a really great husband to pretty bad at both uh, as a result of my disease. And so uh, my daughter brought us together. Uh, we went for a hike together. And I made amends to my ex. And I was honest with her. I told her the truth. That, um, my, I went to, my sponsor helped me with it. Um, and then I thought, I was, it was, I thought it, was, it was great. And then I told my daughter. And she said, Dad, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, darn it. I, I thought it was over. <laughs> so and I, to get back to my question <laughs> about progression, right? <laughs> right. So I've, I've had to do it more and more. Because <laughs> more things come back. And then I had to be honest, and she wanted to ask questions. And um, um, she, my, uh, so her name is Melissa. She said to my daughter, she said, the old Paul is back, but more so. Isn't that sweet? So I was thinking that as you were talking to just, at, and you talked about shame and thinking we're bad people. I, I just truly believe that inherently people are not bad you know, like at the core and especially the lawyers. I mean, we're service oriented. We're out here trying to help other people. That's who we are. Right. And then we get sidetracked with whatever stress or overworked or, you know, we go to law school and maybe start drinking too much or start experience with drugs. And then you lose who that is. Right. You lose who your core personality is and you become, I remember at times telling people, you know, Just remember when you're talking to somebody in the throes of addiction, you are not talking to them. It's almost like you're talking to a parasite that is whatever substance they're on, right? Is trying to survive. Yeah. Through them. That's a great point. A parasite. I call it a terrorist. I think I was hijacked. It is. My personality, my brain was hijacked. Yeah. Or or like it's almost like an exorcism. You know, they've been possessed. I mean, because it is because you, who you are goes out and it becomes a survival of this substance abuse you know, to survive. And that 100% makes sense. And that's the beauty of recovery, right? And then you just keep getting better because it's progressive. The role in your ongoing community, you talked about your AA community, but what other communities do you have that help you um, stay sober and stay in your, in your program? Well, thank you. I have a daily minimum regimen. I call it a a regimen because it's a combination of practices and routines. So obviously the routines include like uh, brushing my teeth and oral care, nasal care, um, um, things like that. Take an allergy medicine during allergy season. Right. Or, you know, I have to do my flushes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, and I have to take I only take one medication uh, now for my GERD, a meprazole. But I'm off of all medications. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, which is pretty cool. I, was, I had very high blood pressure and that's a gone. I also try to uh, walk uh, 10 to 12,000 steps every day, uh, sometimes less, sometimes more, but I try to average that. I pray and meditate every morning. I make my bed the first thing I do every morning, um, and it actually feels like an accomplishment. Uh, for years, I wouldn't make my bed. I would say, no, nah, I'm just going to mess it up again. Um, so I try to eat my, primarily a plant-based diet. I don't eat uh, added sugar. I don't eat a lot of any processed foods. I've changed my diet because I'm convinced for me, inflammation causes me pain. So anything I can do to reduce inflammation helps me both mentally and physically. And there's been some research that says walking is one point times more effective for antidepressants than antidepressant medications for people with depression. 
Um, I love to walk. When I get frustrated, I'm like, I think I'm going to take my dogs for a walk. <laughs> yeah. So like I used to go play tennis uh, instead of, and then when I couldn't play tennis, I went to drink. But now instead of uh, relieving stress, I go for a walk. Right. I'm in nature. There's a great um, uh, a psychologist that says that if you can do anything you love to do and use all your senses at the same time, you automatically put your brain in the present moment. Like if you can hike and you can smell the flowers. Five, you you can, can, yeah. Name, name three or four things with your each sense. Yeah, it something works. like that. It grounds you, it centers Whether you. Whether you're swimming or hiking or cooking or, or gardening, anything, try to use all your senses and it, it will relax your brain. Pretty yeah. cool. So it obviously took you a while to get to this point of where you do all these uh, exercises, whether it be spiritual or, or physical or whatever, every single day. And so for somebody that's in the throes of addiction and really can't see a way out, that might be overwhelming to them. Sure. So what would you say to them that what's just a good couple of first steps they can take? Well, one first step, call T-Lab. Yes. And call me or anybody here confidentially. Another thing is um, recognize progress over perfection. Yes. It's baby steps. Your brain, I'm convinced in neuroplasticity uh, with regard to my brain and my body. So when I went to rehab, I said, what if I did have that major back surgery and I need six to nine months to rehab? I'm going to have to be patient. So I think patience is important. But you have to start um, uh, acting. This is for me. I had to act my way to proper thinking because my brain had been changed. I couldn't think my way into proper acting. That's right. So like, I, like going to AA or going to smart recovery, which I've done, I've also done Dharma recovery. I've done um, refuge recovery. I've done other types of approaches to find one that matches me. Right. But I build a community, at least, to ha- you know, like I said, you know, find people that have what you want and be patient. And sometimes I I love this part of the program where they say, you know, it's one day at a time, right? But sometimes when you're having a really bad day, it's not one day at a time. It might be one hour at a time. It might be one minute at a time, or it might be one second at a time, but it just takes one second over and over and over again, or one second of practicing that, that mindfulness or that peacefulness or whatever, you know, gets you away from what's pulling you away from who you actually are to make a change. Well, it's like physical. I mean, if you want to go work out in the gym, but this is it. You have to, I, I had to identify as a person in recovery, just like I had to identify as somebody that's an, that is an athlete. Mm-hmm. That I'm more likely to act that way. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, you have to be patient. You know, for, for me, when I started my change in my diet, I just would go on Amazon and only order food in my house that was healthy. I stopped ordering chips and cookies and ice cream. So if I got hungry, I would have almonds because that's all I had in the house or carrots because that's all I had in the house. (laughs) I mean, it it wasn't easy. It was hard to do that in the beginning. But then my brain started changing. My taste buds started changing. So I think that's the same with Rick. But then I feel so much better. Yeah. It's a whole body approach. Yeah, but I also feel better in recovery. Like you said, uh, what do I do? So I have a community of golfers that don't drink. I have a community of hikers that don't, don't drink or drug. I have a, so when I want to go out and, and socialize, I have a healthy community to do things that I like to do. And that's everywhere. And there's those communities inside the legal profession. And people like you or other people at TLAP can help you connect with those, yes. those individuals. Isn't that right? Yeah. So if we, uh, we've been going for about an hour and we'll probably need to wrap this up, but I want to wrap up with, you know, if there's just one thing you would like to say to someone struggling with mental health, um, struggles or addiction or thoughts of suicide, what's, what's the one thing you would say to them? Uh, You're not alone. Yeah. You know, we've been there where you're at and there's the way out and just help let us help you absolutely well thank you paul that's why we're doing this podcast that's why we're writing the articles and that's why we're trying to stop the stigma because we want people to understand that no matter what they're going through uh especially in the legal profession that they're not alone yeah thank you very much i appreciate the opportunity thanks for attending the podcast and uh be on the lookout for more to come